Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first 2023 Canals Fellowship One to Learn seminar. As Lisa mentioned, my name is Brianna Yancey, and I am a current fellow working with the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Lab. And as a member of the One to Learn committee, I will be your moderator for today. Our first talk is from Dr. Kalina Grab. Kalina recently earned her PhD in chemical ocean oceanography from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Woodhull's Oceanographic Institute joint program. She is passionate about applying science across sectors to make it actionable and accessible to global communities. In her free time, Kalina can be found studying the ocean dynamics through diving, surfing, sailing, and or long swims on the beach. And I'll let her take it away. Thanks so much, Brianna, and thank you for everyone for joining us today. Um, I feel honored to kick off the webinar series. Um, so as mentioned, I recently defended my PhD from the MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Joint Program in Chemical Oceanography, and I'm now a Canals Fellow in the Ocean Acidification Program at NOAA. Um, so today I'll share with you a little bit about my PhD research and my thesis. Um, we'll get, dive a little bit into the weeds and then hopefully bring you back out as well. Um, so first, before I get into the details, I'll give you an intro of the coastal environments as well as reactive oxygen species. And that'll lead us to the overall goal of this thesis, which was to investigate the role of reactive oxygen species or ROS in coral organism health. So as many of you think about on this call, I'm sure, um, coastal ecosystems such as coral reefs are really vital to our ecosystems and coastal communities. For example, over 25% of fish spend some portion of their life on coral reefs, and so it contributes to the biodiversity within our oceans. Corals are also the basis of our economies, such as uh, tourism and fisheries, and they also provide coastal protection, which can amount to up to $11 trillion a year. So despite all of these benefits that corals provide, they are still degrading rapidly. And a lot of this is due to stressors, which are largely anthropogenic in origin. Many of these stressors, such as those indicated on uh, the, the screen now, can be exacerbated with climate change, which is increased the frequency and intensity. And despite all of these pressures and stressors, the health, the, there's limited knowledge about the health of coral ecosystems. For example, when looking at corals, the best that we can do to assess their health is to visually look at them. So a healthy coral, such as that pictured on the left, is pigmented and rich in color. And when it becomes unhealthy, such as those on the right in the center, we can see that they are white in color and show signs of um, things such as disease and bleaching. However, by the time that we can see these visual changes, it is too late to help the corals. And so we want to understand how can we better predict the health of coral? When we think about ourselves as humans, we use routine checkups, we track vital signs, we draw blood in order to diagnose conditions and establish a baseline for early detection of health conditions. So despite the importance of corals to our economies and our coastal environments, these tools have not yet been developed. So there is emerging technology and it is necessary to push it forward in order to give our reefs hope. So in my thesis, what I focus on were one suite of chemicals that are well-known indicators in the health of organisms such as humans. And these are called reactive oxygen species or ROS. They are known to play a role in the health of other organisms and function, but they're currently underutilized in marine environments and they may play a potentially very important role. So ROS are intermediates in the oxygen cycle. They are produced during the reduction of oxygen to water, and they can be formed in many different biotic and abiotic pathways. And some of the most commonly addressed and spoken about ROS are superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and hydroxyl radical. As indicated by their name, they're really reactive with many different compounds. And so therefore, they have a very short half-life. For example, superoxide can be around on the order of seconds to minutes, whereas hydrogen peroxide can last for somewhere around the order of minutes to hours. So this here is a coral polyp, and it is a depiction that can symbolize other organisms as well. And 
ROS can be produced both intracellularly or inside the cell or extracellularly or outside the cell. And it is noted that superoxide, which uh, are indicated in orange, cannot pass through biological membranes. So in this talk here, we will be focusing on the extracellular superoxide. And therefore, we know that the origin of this superoxide is from outside the organism. So ROS can be beneficial and harmful to different organisms. For example, if they build up inside an organism, it can lead to oxidative stress. But if there is too little of ROS present, then it can inhibit essential physiological processes. So it's a little bit like the Goldilocks effect where you need just the right amount. Traditionally, ROS have mainly had a negative connotation associated with us. And that is because when they build up inside of us, they can lead to precursor of many different diseases, such as those listed on the screen on the left. That's why we are encouraged to eat foods that are rich in antioxidants, such as blueberries or spinach or dark chocolate. And we also see that in many organisms, there are ROS degrading enzymes, such as superoxide dismutase, catalase, and peroxidase. So the widespread importance of antioxidants and these ROS degrading enzymes indicate how important ROS, regulating ROS is to the health of organisms. So although it has not been extensively studied within marine environments, there has been some research looking at the role of extracellular ROS production to organisms. And we have found that these can play roles in physiochemical defenses or biological interactions, as well as innate physiology. And we've also seen that there are different organisms that are associated with these roles of ROS, such as seaweed, bacteria, phytoplankton, and even coral. And so previously it has been noted that coral can play, or the ROS that are produced by coral can play a role in prey acquisition or bacterial defense. However, when we look at this larger piece of um, the puzzle, we notice that coral so far have only been identified to um, have a few associations with them in terms of the role that ROS can play. But this is largely due to the lack of research, not because uh, scientists do not believe that there is potential for ROS to play more roles. And so that leads us to believe that there are other roles that ROS can play in coral health, such as those listed on the screen here. But you might be wondering, why is there not more research on this then? Well, superoxide in particular is really hard to study because it has such a short half-life. So it's difficult to use traditional measuring techniques where you may collect water and bring it back to a lab in order to analyze. With superoxide, you have to bring the lab to the production site. And you can imagine that this is not simple to do. So this was the main motivation for my PhD because prior to this, there was no way to measure superoxide in situ with submersible instruments. And there's particular interest in investigating the ROS in these coastal ecosystems because these coastal ecosystems are an ideal environment to produce ROS since there's lots of UV radiation as well as oxygen production. And so that leads me back to the goal of my thesis, which was to investigate the role of reactive oxygen species in coral organism health. So here I'll provide an outline for the remainder of this talk. So I just talked to you about uh, the role that ROS can play in coastal ecosystems and a little bit more about ROS in general. Next, I'll uh, talk to you about the development of in-situ sensor to measure superoxide, which we call DISCO, um, and the application of using DISCO with corals. And then I'll look at the mechanisms of production within corals, uh, such as looking at the genomes and the presence of superoxide-producing enzyme NADPH oxidase, or NOx. I also did look at seagrasses and the role of ROS cycling within their environments, but I won't touch on that today. But I just wanted to put it out there, if anyone wants to talk about seagrass, I'm interested. So moving back to the first part of this talk. So here we designed and optimized a submersible instrument to measure superoxide in situ. And again, the reason why this is so important is because using traditional methods, it is really hard to measure superoxide because it has such a short half-life. 
So I worked with a team of engineers and scientists at HUI, and this team was vital to make this project happen because we needed the engineering expertise to develop it. And as scientists, we were testing and verifying it and working back and forth with the engineers to help improve this instrument. And ultimately, we developed the diver-operated submersible chemiluminescent sense ore, or how we like to refer to it as DISCO. So this was a long process throughout my PhD, and we started with the development of DISCO-1. I actually entered the lab on the first day, and there was a piece of cardboard with two pumps on it. And so that's how the instrument started. We were able to verify the method using DISCO-1, but as you can see in the photo on the left, it's a really big, robust instrument. So it helped me with weightlifting and working out, but it really wasn't practical to use uh, for many different environments. So then we moved forward and with three years of testing and redesigning and trial and a lot of error, we were able to develop DISCO-2, which is what I'll focus on on today's talk, and we'll just call it DISCO since this is the current design. So I was fortunate during some of the field work, there are some videographers down there, and so I'm able to share some, some footage of how we use DISCO. So all the video here, um, which might be a little choppy, um, was filmed by Dan Mele. And in it, you can see me using DISCO underwater. So I'm able to swim around with this instrument and I can approach corals in order to measure them. And you'll also notice that I'm able to look at this screen, which I'll go into in more detail. So DISCO uses a flow injection chemiluminescent method. And what this means is that it uses a reagent, so NCLA as noted on the screen, that emits light when it reacts with superoxide. And this is very specific to superoxide. So it has three microfluidic, microfluidic pathways within the instrument. And using the sample wand, we can take an analyte fluid and simultaneously the reagent, MCLA, will mix with this analyte fluid in the spiral flow cell. This mixture will then cause the amount of superoxide within the analyte fluid to emit photons that are proportional to the concentration of superoxide. And we have a photomultiplier tube that is adjacent to this flow cell that can then measure the amount of light that is being produced. And that is how we can tell how much superoxide is in the sample. We have SOD, which again is the superoxide degrading enzyme. And this we use in order to verify that we are measuring superoxide. So we'll spot check throughout the sampling. When we collect a sample, we move the wand really close to the surface of the coral, but we do not have to touch it. And it, we measure for about one to two minutes. It collects a sample twice every second. We then can average all of these data points across the coral individual. This uh, DISCO also has a touchscreen tablet, which is really awesome because it allows us to view the data in real time. We also can touch it underwater and operate the pumps, change the PMT settings, or annotate the data. And because this is a full computer, we are able to operate it using Python software, and so it's customizable for other operations or other measurements that also want to be made. And so all of these parameters I put up uh, on the screen are a result of the benchtop testing that we had done. And really what's important is that we were able to uh, measure, we were able to create DISCO so that it has a limit of detection lower than target values. It has flow rates and residence times that are optimized for these environments and is also a convenient size for diving. Uh, we also collect metadata with our sampling conditions so that we're able to apply that to the data later. And I was also fortunate to be able to collect data across a range of environments. So I looked uh, at superoxide concentrations associated with coral in Cuba and USVI, as well as the Florida Reef Track. And here today, I'll share the data from the Florida Keys. So to orient you to this graph, on the y-axis, we have superoxide concentration, which has been seawater normalized. And on the left axis, we will show all of the coral species, except for on the right axis, we're gonna separate out the parietes species. And across the x-axis, you can see all the different coral species, which are also pictured on the sides here. We have different colors, which indicate the different reef sites. And as I put the data up, you'll notice that there are error bars, and these uh, indicate every bar is one coral individual, and the error bar is the standard deviation across that individual. So one thing, the first thing that we noticed is that we 
measure really high superoxide concentrations associated with healthy coral. We can see that there's also a species-specific difference. So group A, which is in the center, those are the parietes species, which again are on the right axis, and they are significantly higher superoxide concentrations associated with parietes species than with the other species. And so we asked ourselves why. Why are we seeing that parietes are producing so much superoxide? Well, when we think about parietes, and in particular parietes asteroides, which is pictured here, we can see that it is very stress resistant. It's actually increasing in abundance in the Caribbean, whereas most corals are decreasing in abundance, and it's able to adapt quickly. So we don't know how superoxide is being produced or why, but these are interesting correlations that we observed. When we zoom in on Parietes asteroides on the left, we also see that within the species, the individuals have a lot of variation in the superoxide that they produce. And so this brings us back to the circle chart that I walked through earlier with all of the different possibilities that ROS could be playing in the organisms. And it can allow us to speculate that based on other organisms, it is likely that there are other processes happening. There are other roles that superoxide is playing associated with the health of these organisms. Because just like humans, there, these coral individuals may be involved in different activities, such as feeding, or they might be in different life stages or growth cycles or have different metabolic rates. And so it's likely that the ecological and physiological variations could be impacting these superoxide concentrations. A previous study also observed that there were polyp scale differences in terms of uh, superoxide production. So it's important to think about all these different scales that can vary. So the summary of the first two chapters, we were able to develop the first uh, in situ submersible instrument that can measure superoxide. And then we observe species specific variation in superoxide measurements associated with the coral. And while this was helpful, it also less with left us with a lot of questions like why and how are corals producing superoxide and why do we see this species specific variation and so that led me to my next chapter which i wanted to look at the widespread genetic potential for superoxide to produce for corals to produce superoxide and so as a reminder, we saw some corals that had low superoxide concentrations, whereas other corals like Parietes species had really high superoxide concentrations. And we know from other organisms that this enzyme, NOx, is widespread across eukaryotes. However, it has not been thoroughly investigated within coral. And so this is the only enzyme to generate ROS as, for its sole purpose. And it sits on the outer membrane of the epidermis and produces extracellular superoxide using the internal substrate of NADPH. We also know that NOx has several different types um, and these can collectively be referred to as NOx. So we asked the question, do coral have NOx? And if they do, then what type of NOx do they have? And in order to investigate this, I built a bioinformatic pipeline that used conserved NOx sequences from other organisms as references, and then allowed us to build profiles of each NOx type, which we then searched across the coral genomes to identify NOx-like coral sequences. And we verified this with BLAST. And what we were able to find uh, were that most corals had NOx. This chart here shows the coral species that we investigate on the left, and across the top are different NOx types. The blue squares indicate when NOx is present. And you'll notice that many coral have several types of NOx, and nearly all of them have NOx. And so we have confirmed here that most corals have the genetic potential to produce superoxide, but then why do we still see the different concentrations? And if you remember, there are different types of NOx. So maybe it's the NOx type that's driving the superoxide variation. In order to look at that, we used a phylogenetic tree of the NOx sequences. And in this tree, the black are references from other organisms, and the colors are all different coral NOx-like sequences from different NOx types. 
So what we wanted to see is when we overlay the superoxide concentrations on top of this, which the three dots are high superoxide and the one dot is low superoxide, we would think that if the NOx type is driving the superoxide concentrations, then the superoxide concentrations would cluster together on this tree. And we do not see that. And therefore, it suggests that the superoxide concentrations that are associated with the coral are not driven by the type of NOx that the coral has. So then we wanted to investigate a little bit further. What the concentrations that I had showed earlier were steady state, and so that is a function of production and decay. So we wanted to understand, is it the production or is it the decay driving this? So we went forward and measured the decay rates associated with the corals. And so this graph here has the same coral species along the x-axis as the previous data. And on the y-axis is the superoxide decay rate constant. And what you can notice here is that they all look pretty similar. And in fact, there's no statistical difference between these different decay rates. And this makes sense because superoxide is mainly decayed through microbial and enzymatic processes or dissolved organic molecules, which have longer half-lives, which are expected to be homogeneous across a reef scale. So taking all of this evidence, we can go back and think about, so with process of elimination, it doesn't seem like it is the NOx type that is driving these variations in superoxide concentrations, and it's also not the degra degradation rates. So it must be the differential production of the that the coral are producing that are leading to these variation and superoxide concentrations that we see. And when we look at other organisms, we can speculate that uh, the production of superoxide could be regulated by or could be controlled by the regulation and expression of NOx. And this is seen in humans and other organisms that NOx is a very closely regulated enzyme. And this could also mean that it's a fundamental physiological response of these coral that are controlling these different superoxide concentrations that we have seen. And so when we revisit this diagram, we can speculate that it is possible that ROS is playing a role in, within corals that is similar to other roles that we have seen across other organisms. And so this pink bar that indicates corals could expand wider across this array, but it requires further verification and research to be sure. So with this, we have seen that ROS are produced by coral and these are healthy coral and they also are producing really high concentrations. And so it's important to consider further what impact this has not only on the coral organisms but also the biogeochemical cycles and the redox state of coral reef environments. So overall and as a summary, I contributed, uh, I'll summarize a little bit of the contribution of my research to this area. Um, so we looked at the widespread measurements of superoxide associated with corals by developing the first submersible in situ instrument to measure superoxide. And we also saw that corals are a huge source of ROS and it varies by species. We also identified a potential production mechanism within coral and we saw that all coral have NOx, which was previously unknown. And this suggests that superoxide could play a role in immune responses. So overall, ROS is a critical uh, suite of chemicals to investigate further and look at the impact of the organism, of health of organisms as well as ecosystem function. It has not been previously considered in most studies. So this thesis lays the foundation for further investigation and also the potential for ROS to be an indicator of health, which could be a tool that is necessary to help protect our coastal ecosystems for the future. So with that, I would like to say thanks to all those that I worked with. It definitely takes a village to complete a PhD, and I was not alone in this process at all. Um, I would love to answer any emails or chat about anything that, or answer questions, which you can ask here or via email, and happy to have follow-up discussions in any way. So thank you for listening, and I hope that you have learned something today. Thank you so much for your presentation, Kalina. That was wonderful. Um, audience, we do have about five minutes to answer your questions, so please type them in the questions chat box, and I'll read them to Kalina. 
And uh, before we do that, I will also encourage you to download Kalina's slides, which are attached as a handout in the control panel. Um, and we did get a question um, just now. So let's start with this one. How do you know uh, that superoxide is produced by corals and not by symbiotic algae or bacteria? Yeah, thank you for that question. That is very important. Um, so there are previous studies that have showed that the amount of superoxide that we are observing associated with corals has to be from the coral, or not has to be, is likely from the coral host itself. Um, so there are microbes associated with coral. There's um, also mucus within the coral, but there have been studies that have sloughed the mucus off and seen that there is the same amount of production and that have also looked at the communities that are associated with corals. Um, and they just, they produce superoxide on, a, on orders of magnitude less than what we are observing here. Excellent. Um, I'm gonna give this another second to see if we get any more questions. And uh, just as a reminder, um, we will have a second presentation in a moment, but uh, today's event is being recorded and I will have uploaded the recordings to both presentations to the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel by the end of the day, which I, I put the link in our, our chat. All right, oh, we have another question. Uh, this question says, great talk. Do you think environmental factors like salinity, light intensity, pH, etc., could be affecting superoxide production you see between species because of their location? Could stressful conditions increase production? Yes, thank you so much for that question. So there's a lot of things to consider with this. So when we were doing, the answer is yes, environmental conditions can definitely play a role in the superoxide concentrations. The way that we were sampling is we would pick uh, areas where we had all the coral species in one area, and then we would sample right next to each other. So even if a coral, we have some, there's one study that showed that even if a coral is next to each other, you can move the wand across and it will be near background seawater. And then you move over, let's say a priority species and it spikes up. So this is on a very small scale variation that we are seeing the differences of superoxide concentrations. Um, so we also do know though that environmental conditions can play a role on the larger scale, because if you think about it, the environmental conditions impact coral reefs on a larger scale than on an individual basis. Um, so these can play a role um, in the production of superoxide. A lot of times the stress conditions can increase the intracellular superoxide concentrations, which has been implicated in coral bleaching. But what we're looking at here is the extracellular superoxide production. So we actually think that it may be benefiting the coral, but for example, like if the coral is getting attacked by a pathogen, then there's been studies that show corals release higher bursts of ROS. So it, it has, there's a lot of nuances here in terms of the role of stress and health and the benefit and detriment of ROS. I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Uh, this next question asks, what are your thoughts on this technology for deep corals like those of the Mid-Atlantic Canyons? Yeah, great question. So actually the lab I worked in also developed a deep sea um, sensors. So in the photo here on the upper right, you'll see us huddling around this black tower box. And that's a deep sea sensor that has measured superoxide associated with deep sea coral. I think the paper is coming out somewhat soon from my lab mate, Lena Tanzer. Um, and we were able to show that you can also use this technology in the same way. Um, and this instrument can be mounted on a submersible, like it was on Alvin, or it can be put on a carousel and run remotely through a wire as well. Excellent. Um, well, thank you. That, I think that's our last question for today. 